All right, welcome to Esoteric Lectures. Um, today we're going to be finishing up part two of the Beyond the Black Rainbow Gnostic analysis of the movie uh, Beyond the Black Rainbow. And um, wanted to uh, go ahead and continue on where we left off, which was, let me just fix my notes here. Last where we left off, we were discussing uh, Dr. Nile, and he was on the phone with, if my notes would cooperate, uh, let's see here. He was on the phone, and he had gotten a strange phone call from a unaudible type of computer, basically. It was a computer message that was being transmitted through his telephone. And what you saw was, here we go. What you saw was basically at the end of the scene where we left off, the phone was disconnected. And of course, obviously, I guess what is being illustrated here is that uh, he was not uh, communicating with it through the phone. It was kind of an astral type of frequency or, or computer that was communicating with him. And what we had alluded to is that basically this is possibly the Demiurge uh, getting in contact with him about his progress that was being made with Elena. And I guess he was, the Demiurge or uh, Legion or demons were telling him his next move uh, with Elena. Um, so that's where we left off in our part one. So we will continue today. <clears throat> now, from that scene, we see number 44, uh, Dr. Nile is now in a, seems to be a, a, uh, a strange room or possibly something going on inside of his head. And what you notice in the background is clay, basically is how Johnny explained it to me, uh, is that there's clay running down the backs of the walls, which Johnny, I'm going to throw this to you because you broke this down for me and I'm going to let you take the lead on that explanation of it uh, to surmise our last uh, description of it. So go right ahead. Hi, I'm Johnny Midnight and I am a co-host of Esoteric Lectures and what Element's talking about tonight is the formation or reformation or what a Gnostic would call the re-smith of a human form and that is a, a being made or forged from clay. The clay is the matter, uh, you know, uh, at least symbolically, of a new life being reformed and reincarnated into the corposa. And that scene, which we're, uh, you know, showing right here is exactly what's happening to Dr. Nile, he is being reborn and 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 re-smithed into the prime material reality. Yes, and uh, as we move on through the notes, um, we will see that actually take place. If I'm not mistaken, I don't think we've actually gone over that specific part yet. Um, I think it's further down the notes here. We will see possibly that uh, really show itself in one of the scenes here. So he's being re refashioned um, because he is part of a grander scheme of the um, founder of the Aboria Institute, which as we move through the notes here, I think is where it shows it. I'm not mistaken, I don't think we've passed it, but you will see the founder of the Arboria Institute, which is the, uh, which Dr. Nile is an employee of. We will, uh, you will see what his purpose is and how he relates to this in the Gnostic story. So number 45, we move on to see where we have Elena and she's in her cell. And one of the nurses there is talking to her because Elena has a picture of, uh, I guess, her mom. And if you look at the picture, I didn't have it in my notes, so I took a picture of it. But in the film, you see it's a very, it's, I don't think it was actually a, a picture of a person as much as it was a very disfigured uh, color. And what I find interesting specifically, and this is kind of jumping ahead just a tad bit, within uh, the structure of what we were discussing to Dr. Nile and the clay is that it was 
almost like the picture itself was that of the Hyle. It was illustrating where she is and where mom really is. Um, due to the dis it's just the color of the picture. I should have taken a picture of it or, or a screen share of it. But it looks like it's very similar to what Dr. Nile goes through as we move on through his process in the story. And the nurse goes, is she your mother? And she goes, where is she? Well, obviously her mother is Lilith. Um, as we have discussed in the last as part, in part one of our breakdown, Elena is basically what we believe a possible manifestation or a agent of some sorts along the lines of taking the characteristics of an antichrist. Right, exactly. Elena is basically a child of Lilith, whereas Christ was a child of Sophia, uh, you know, brought unto a, a prime material womb of Mary. This girl, Elena, is a counteraction or an answer to that. Um, and the contrapositive to a, a Christ, an antichrist. And instead of being a child of Sophia, it is a, Elena is a child of Lilith. And the nurse goes, did she die? And so she is basically making, uh, you know, another kind of, I guess you can say allegory as to what happened to Lilith and her being cast out into the Red Sea, that of death, or um, her aspect of her entity, so to speak, being in the land of the dead. Um, you know, you could go many different ways with that statement. Uh, number 46, so we see Dr. Nile uh, after the nurse goes into her cell, Dr. Nile goes to the device which then is like a giant knob, which emanates a very high pitch frequency or a low frequency. And basically when he turns this thing up, Elena basically starts going crazy or, or she starts to lose her mind. But I guess what's happening here is that she's, through that frequency, she's basically getting information directly from the Hyle that's being sent down or the machine that is emanating or the Baphomet that's emanating that frequency, she's getting directly tied into it. She's getting the frequency of information that is basically opening, as we see in Johnny, we've discussed this off air, that it's a basically a, a black hole that emits this frequency. And in this picture, number 46, the device later on in the movie begins to make a, a like a vortex. So it's another explanation here. It's another, it's showing you that whatever that device is, wherever it's at specifically, Elena is tied into it and Dr. Now can control that thing to do what he wants to her. The, the Baphomet is basically a multiprocessor that exists in the Heil, the realm above us. And as above, so below, this device here, it, which has no name uh, in the movie, is been constructed to mimic that as an interface for a breeding ground uh, for a, I guess you could call it a, uh, a nursery for that spiritual entity in the Corposa here in the prime material reality. And, and, and the Arborea Institute has found a way to make that happen, to make that into reality. And th this is evidence of that. And then we move on to number 47, where after that ha scene happens, um, basically what happens was when Dr. Now turns up the frequency, um, the woman or the nurse, um, blood starts coming out of her nose and she gets, she dies basically through a kind of internal uh, aneurysm or some, something happened to her. The frequency basically either uh, caused her to die or it caused Elena to cause the nurse to die. Um, so the frequency device is something that Elena is directly tied into and it causes her to use her powers uh, to for destruction and then she ends up killing the nurse. So number 47, we see 
Dr. Now basically opens the door to her cell after the nurse is killed. And I see this almost like he's rewarding her in a way and reinforcing the programming of her destruction after she killed the nurse by opening the cell uh, to her room to let her out. And um, what I find interesting about this is through researching this and making my notes that it made me wonder if the phone call previously from that device or those demonic entities, whatever they were that contacted him, uh, told Dr. Nile to let her out. And I think so. Contacted. I think so. I think that, uh, that, you know, strange language, possibly goetic was instructing Dr. Nile to, uh, let her out and to unleash her onto the earth. That's what I seem to have believed as well when I was uh, going through that, um, because it happens directly after he got the phone call. And, and once that he got that phone call, everything starts moving in motion throughout the movie. So we see number 48, Elena leaves her room after the door is opened. And basically her cube or her, the prison of her mind, um, uh, basically, the portal or the veil representing the door is torn. It's opening. So, uh, through the movie, it's basically illustrating that the veil that she is kept in, the prison of her little cell, is that that veil or that doorway is now open for her to access and begin her mission. And once that happens, we see number 49, basically, Legion or the demons are activated by... A device that pyramidal device uh, a scene starts where it says run program sentinots and the only other explanation I could explain or figure out of what what that means is that it's probably demons or legion being activated of some sorts the purpose of which I'm not sure of but I guess under the grander story of what Elena represents this whole story is telling you that the age of Aquarius uh, probably has begun, and thus they also have a part to play in it. And number 50, we see the Legion Demons, and that is being cast here through a red figure that is uh, multiplying in multiplicity many different images of itself in these mirrors. And that's what led me to believe that that's Legion, and for most people that don't understand legion is a a group of demonic entities that are of many legion is like um legions meaning many or numbers of them and so that's why they call them legions because it's a hive large massive uh untold amounts of, of demonic entities that's why they call them legion and yeah so that's and, and, and 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 with the activation of elena it was so so runs the activation of the Legion. It's almost like Elena is the head um, general in command, so to speak, of which Legion then follows, because if this is the case that uh, Elena is, is a, me a, a manifestation or an emanation of this Antichrist type of figure, then of course they would fall in line as well to complete right. the job. Kind of like the Queen Bee in a beehive she would be the queen and the bees would be the legions. So that scene there is, is, is why what led me to that conclusion that it, it's probably legion due to the number and the many of what's being shown in that scene. Um, now, number 51, I'm going to, uh, Johnny, I know I wrote some notes there, but I'm going to leave this to you. Um, what we see here is something kind of unrelated that I had made a personal note of, but it is completely related. Um, which is something I don't think we have necessarily gone into in great depths, but you see pink and yellow um, in this scene here. And what Johnny explained to me was that pink and yellow represents in the Gnostic information, Pistis and Sophia. So Johnny, um, why don't you give people maybe a little bit of a back background on that and maybe how you think it kind of ties into the scene. Okay, Pistis and Sophia are two aeons in the Gnostic pantheon. They exist in the Plerma. Sophia is wisdom, which would be, represent the pink color, and Pistis is 
faith, which would represent the yellow. Now, the, the two work in tandem together to create knowledge. If you do not have um, wisdom with faith, you have belief. And belief would be equivalent to blind faith. Um, and, and here what we have is a juxtaposition of <clears throat> wisdom and faith here uh, that, that's manifested in this movie as an elevator, um, you know, a cycle going up and down. And what we're talking about is the passage of rulership from Dr. Nile to Elena. Elena is the manifestation of rulership here. And it's it's going to her as she goes through the elevator. Yeah, I, I found that scene very interesting because, you know, Johnny, we had discussed this and I was trying to figure out what specifically as to why those colors, but now that you've you've said that um it seems to be that's the case that it's kind of like a it's a higher dimensional order i guess you could say of um the grander scheme of completing a, a larger mission right and, and it's it's, yeah. it's being yeah it's being illustrated in a prime material reality um mechanization such as an elevator up and down as above so below we can find this type of cycle happening and it's being illustrated perfectly through the colors of faith, that being yellow, and then we have your pinkish red, that being wisdom. Now, after that scene happens, now we go into where things begin to start uh, really showing the movie for what it, what it really is. And Dr. Nile takes an elevator and the elevator basically is a representation of an elevator that goes between different dimensions. That's what the symbolic meaning of the elevator, in my opinion, is. Um, because he's going from different levels in the Kabbalah. You have the different trees, the Sephiroth or uh, whatnot. And, and so the elevator is kind of a representation of going from one dimension to the other. So Dr. Nile, of course, in the grander Gnostic scheme of this, in my opinion, that the Arborea Institute is basically taking place in the Heil. Because as we move through this uh, analysis, you will see why. Now, we get to the founder of the Arborea Institute, which is basically uh, an older gentleman that Dr. Nile takes the elevator to, to his room. Um, again, he's probably going up the elevator. I didn't catch that. I don't know if it showed it, but he probably went up the elevator. Um, or, or, or not, but we see the founder of the Abori Institute, the original founder, and, well, basically what's being shown here is that that's Jehovah. Uh, again, a man that's, that's aging. He's, he's getting old. He's well, not the uh, Also, you got to remember, too, his name is Mercury, Mercurio, uh, Apollo. Apollo is the... Oh, wow. Yeah, exactly. That that is the the Greek version of Jehovah. You know, the sun god. So here we're seeing a dying sun god. This age is ending. And that's very important to this film. I didn't so, catch that. that oh yeah, yeah, sense. yeah. Mercury Mercurio Apollo Jehovah. Well, that's interesting as which we see Apollo, the sun god, um, and feeble. We yeah. As we were looking at, at off here, we were discussing some information relating to the sun god, that of Abraxas and the lion. So Mercury or Apollo, the sun god, is a direct correlation to that as well. Um, so obviously we see Mercuria Aborea. And he's aging and he's old and he's got gray hair, which is again just like the Matrix, another Jehovah representation in a film. Um, anytime that you look at these characters, especially Jehovah being portrayed in films, he's always got gray hair or a gray beard, always. 
That's always how he's depicted in these movies. So he's Dr. Niles talking with Mercuria Boria, and he's saying, uh, Mercuria is saying to Dr. Nile, the trappings of the mortal world are but a distraction. So, you know, Johnny, I, I think what might be shown here is that either A, he realizes that the world that he's created is, well, maybe he's trying to give gnosis to Dr. Nile. I'm not exactly sure what's being illustrated here, but I think either A, he's realizing that his creation is something that he's not happy with, or he's realizing what he's done, or he's basically just disseminating knowledge for Dr. to Dr. Nile. What do you think? I don't think that he actually has any kind of uh, true gnosis, that being Dr. Uh, or Arborea. I think that he just suspects it, and he's trying to impart that kind of suspicion to Dr. Nile. Unfortunately, though, it's just too late. Uh, Dr. Nile's far too gone psychologically and psychically. He is at wits with this new creation by the name of Elena. He wants to rule the roost. Unfortunately, Elena has been destined to do so. And we'll see that later on in this movie as we go through. But um, Mercurio Arborea is now enfeebled. He's dying. He is trying to impart what little gnosis and it's very little gnosis that he can to Dr. Nile. It's very, very feeble. Yes, and we, we see that especially he's very sick, it seems like, or his mind is he's lost his mind in a way. He's very um, slurring his speech and he can't really make out uh, too well what he's trying to understand. Um, but we see number 55. Uh, Dr. Arborea is looking at pictures of nature and um, and he goes to Dr. Arborea says it's beautiful they make me remember a, a simpler time and so what this scene I, I was trying to figure out what this actually meant but it made me wonder if it could be a either he's remembering him being in the Palermo or B uh, he remembers his rulership over what he did, and he knows that it's coming to an end. Well, I think that uh, it's the the first is probably the most accurate. You know, Jehovah in the Plerima before that he had decided to abscond from it and create his own realm, and he saw how. He was making something, a facsimile, a simulation, a simulacra of a world that he wanted to create because that's what he knew. But his ability was just not uh, up to par with the original article. Okay? Well, it definitely makes, it definitely, you know, that's definitely something I, <clears throat> I thought as well that that could be the case because otherwise... A simpler time, I mean, you know, through the Gnostic information, uh, we've, I think we've discussed this before in previous Hangouts that Jehovah used to be in the Palermo. And if, again, for those who are unaware, the Palermo is the heaven, the true heaven, not the Heil, the heaven. Well, it's the heaven above the Heil, and uh, we'll have to re-clarify that at some point. But uh, he was in the Heil, I mean, in the Palermo at one point. So that made me think of that. Now... Number 56, this is where things get interesting. We see Dr. Nile um, kind of having a flashback as he's talking with Dr. Arborea in this room. He goes to, and he has a flashback to basically his initiation into what he will become a part of, which is the Arborea Institute. Now, we see a scene where it says 1966. Now, when... How do I explain this? Basically, numerology is very important because numbers also represent entities. So when you add up six and six, you get 12. And number in 12 plus, I mean, two plus one equals three. Now, what you do is you add those numbers and then you add the second part of the numbers. So you add all, all three numbers. Now, this can go, you have to use some mathematics here. 
but your job is to come up with a number within a series of numbers, and this is kind of adva more advanced, but the whole purpose of this is to get more information. Numbers are dissemination of information. The end line is that you, when you add up these numbers, you get 13, basically, and 13 is the number of Jehovah. It's the number of the devil, because if you want to go into this from the astrological perspective, there are 12 signs of the zodiac, and then there's what they call an unknown sign, which is the 13th sign, the one that rules all over all the signs. Well, that would be Jehovah. So what we see here is that it could be possibly 1966 could also be a representation or a uh, mentioning of possibly the beginning of the age of Aquarius. Because what happens next is Dr. Nile um, basically is talking with Dr. Arborea and an, un and an unknown woman, which we know is more than likely Lilith. And he is in this white room. And he is talking with Dr. Arborea. And there's a big black hole in the center of the floor. And basically what happens is he goes in that hole. And I should have made some further notes on that because it was very important. But, uh, Johnny, um, from your recollection, <laughs> he basically goes into that hole and then something happens. Well, you know, you you have to take a look, too. In our world, not you know outside of this film, 1966, it was also the year of that time had declared God dead. There was actually an issue of Time magazine that challenges the existence or, or, or the 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 life of God anymore. And it's it's kind of funny how uh Panos Cosmatos had chosen the the year of 1966 to be the birth of Elena. So yeah, we're we are talking about the possibility of a new age. And just because a new age happens doesn't mean everybody's going to know about it all at once. It takes a process, a, a, a process of conditioning for that age to, be, to come about. So, like, let's say when Jesus was born, nobody knew about this guy until he was 12 years old. And then, you know, they were very few. And then when he became 30, he started preaching. And... At 33, Jesus Christ died and made himself known as the Logos, or the Word of God made flesh. That took 33 years right there. Okay? So, it could take, you know, that many or more years for an Antichrist to be born, to come of age, to germinate her her abilities and then and then disseminate the fruit of her abilities onto the earth well i find it very interesting also is something i was uh, looking into as a side note um, through some gnostic information i was reading about was that it was describing that the actual end of the time happened around um this period um basically was the beginning of, of a, either a new age or the end of time, which I guess would be the same thing. Um, so you're talking about 1966 to about 1973? I, I believe so. I, I believe, and, and what you find here, if you look, Johnny, at the number, it's between 9 and 6, you have 96, which is cancer. Right. Cancer is a very pivotal year because Jesus was uh, apparently a cancer. Um, so or the embodiment of which that age he was in, I, I believe, I'm not sure, it might have been Pisces, if I'm not mistaken. But the Cancer is very specific, especially 96, which makes a, a Cancer sign, which that kind of goes into something unrelated, but the year, I believe you're correct that the year specifically, and when I was reading into this Gnostic information, it said that uh, around this time, um, astrologically as well as what you said about the time magazine right when that happened at the exact same time is when they said that the end of time happened literally it ceased time actually it was before then my, my mistake it was around ad that they said that time ceased to exist even way back in the ad time period 
So I'm not sure yet. You know, that's kind of still skeptical on, on my clarity of that. But sure, sure, I get it. Time, basically, and that's when um, you know that that happened. And so what we see next is that Jehovah is basically reforming Doctor Nile. He goes. Doctor Nile goes into this black substance, which is, in other words, he goes to the Heil if I'm not mistaken, or he's already in the Heil, and what's happening is that he is going to, I guess, a, a Jehovah's workshop, in other words, and he's being reformed. And when you see this scene, um, what you're seeing of, of Dr. Nile is, is that his figure is taking form of clay um, because he's being reformed. In other words, Dr. Nile could be also uh, recluded to Adam. And he's being remade in his image. And when you look at the floor of the black substance that's in the center, it's an eye. The way, because you have the pupil, which is the black substance that he's going into. And you have the white iris of the eye around it. I'll make sure to add that in so that you guys can see that. But what I made the allusion to, you know, all these people talk about, they say all seeing eye, they go, that's the Illuminati. No, it's, in my opinion, what it is is that it's it's a it's a metaphor to Jehovah's eye, which means in His image He creates. So that's why I believe they use the eyes so much because it's Jehovah's eye. Um, and so we go on to see how Doctor Nile is being refashioned, and uh, you see the scenes here in number fifty-seven. The first scene, the first image, the second image, and the third image is basically not only is he being refashioned, but that's the soul that's being reformed and that's why it's in fire and it's being melted and it's being reshaped and basically it's clay. Now actually as we move to number 58 I did take a picture of that scene and what we see here is the black substance which is basically the pupil of the eye and the whiteness around the eye and Adam, I guess you could say it's Adam or Atoms and Dr. Nile are coming from the Heil through the portal after being reformed by Jehovah. And he comes through the portal, and he's all black, and he vomits up this substance just like Neo did in The Matrix, which is basically him breaking free of his pod, or primordial egg, and breaking through to attain his new form, which is now being why he was being refashioned, and then he gave, he gave birth, he was reborn from that primordial egg, and then he's now this new creation. Well, exactly. It's he, this movie is trying to illustrate Ray Smith, you know? Yeah. Being forged once again in your, your pneumatic pod up in the Heil and then being thrust forth into and, and born into the corpus of the prime material reality. And that's what this movie is depicting here in this scene in 1966. Dr. Nile has now been reborn, or more to the point, respond into the prime material reality here. Now, Johnny, do you think that possibly the reason why he's so confused is because he's attained the gnosis of Jehovah? Or, or maybe he's actually had the gnosis, but now he's ignorant again. And he you, lost it. Right, right. Once you have been respawned, you're born once again as ignorant as you were before. He is honestly, I think, bewildered and confused. He that would make is more sense. A, a blank slate now, and he's ready for conditioning. That would definitely make more sense there, that he's he's confused, because as he leaves, he's distraught, and he's confused, and he's scared, or whatever. Yeah. He's screaming, and he doesn't know what's going on, so I guess that would be the uh, side effect of losing knowledge, because now he's being reborn through the portal. Number 59, we now see this woman that was in the beginning of this initiation, which Johnny and I, well, Johnny had told me that and I definitely would agree that I think what's happening here is that that's Eve. And so Adam goes to Eve, but uh, he rejects her. And he bites into her neck. And um, she dies. And so... It, it, it's a bastardization of the Gnostic or priestly version of Genesis in which um, Adam rejected Lilith. Well, here Adam rejects Eve. 
Um, it could be that that was Lilith and not Eve, you think? It could be, yeah, because remember, Elena is not Lilith. She is the Antichrist. She is a product of Lilith. And that could be Lilith. Uh, you know, another allegory, you know, here in the prime material reality where um, we have Adam saying, no, I don't want any of this. You know, this woman is nothing but, you know, a cement boot on my feet. I want her away from me. He attacks her and kills her immediately. And then he bites her on the apple. Yeah. Yeah. I, I made uh, possible that um, another instance for the apple would be that it's, it's, it, I believe that that's another thing, but I think the apple is basically the gnosis or knowledge, which goes into a whole other aspect of it. But nonetheless, he does bite into it, and I thought of the apple. Um, now, after that happens, obviously, Dr. Aboria sees what uh, Dr. Nile has done, or in the Gnostic a aspect of it, Jehovah sees what Adam has done. And he's looking at him and, and is basically... Um, I guess you could say upset he realized well you didn't accept what i had created for you and that's not good now that scene after that scene has happened we flash back to dr nile with dr arborea in his old age back into his room and uh he has to inject um, some sort of substance i guess that's keeping him alive or sedating him or, or of something happening that uh, he injects the syringe into his foot. And, um, you know, basically, when that happens, we flash to Elena feeling, or I guess um, uh, because Jehovah and them, I guess, are, are connected in this sense, she feels that as he, as Dr. Nile puts the syringe in his foot, she also feels that. So I guess it's some sort of uh, connection between. Um, you know, something going on there. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what that's representing, but Elena does feel that happen. There is a connection between the two because in the 1966 uh, vignette that we see in the movie, uh, Dr. Arborea takes the baby Elena and says that, you know, a terrible thing has happened today, but it has also given us a great new wonder. And the two are interlinked, you know, um, very much like Blade Runner 2049. We have the cell, the cell, interlinked, interlinked. The two are interlinked. Okay. This, this, this creation known as Elena, this little homunculus, is a gift unto the world brought about through the death of Lilith and brought about into the world. So what has happened is Jehovah has inadvertently created the Antichrist. I see. Okay. Gotcha. Well, we have that scene happen, and then what happens is number 63. Basically, Jehovah, or Dr. Arborea, is looking at these projections of this... Um, I guess you could say like tropical Hawaiian style utopian area, which he's looking down upon, I guess, in the actual scene is looking down on this uh, city. And what I had made the conclusion of is that through Jehovah's eyes, he's creating the world or seeing through it in his image. Either that or he is looking down upon his creation. I think both are, are uh, there's some both semblance to both of those. And then we see uh, Elena's eye being shown here, right as the next scene happens with Dr. Arborea also viewing this um, city of some sorts. Now, number 64, we see Dr. Nal taking off his wig, or his uniform, or I guess you could say, his, his, his image. And uh, Johnny, you were discussing this with me as we were going over these notes last time, uh, trying to figure out what the scene meant. And I guess what's happening here is that um, he's showing himself for his true colors, I guess. He, he's taking off his appliances. Um, well, well it's, it, it's very much like in the book of Genesis, you know, uh, 
he he is he has found himself naked and he's ashamed and in a later scene with the the character of mary he he is ashamed of who he is you know he he she says you've taken off your appliances and he says i don't want to wear them anymore and you haven't let me see you without them in a long time this is his original form. It's his skin suit and his image. He's he's ashamed of it, but at the same time, he is rebelling against that shame by showing Mary, okay, um, his his true his true form. You know who he is. Yes, and we see him walking into a number sixty-seven. We see him walking towards. Uh, this this lady, I guess who I guess it would be would be Mary. I'm not even you know that was one thing that we were trying to figure out who this character was playing. Rosemary, yeah. And um, he says she says you're not wearing your appliances anymore, and he says I don't want to wear them anymore. And before that, he had taken put on this leather, which obviously leather is skin, so he had put on a new skin suit, so to speak. Uh, or in other words, he maybe had wore, was wearing his original form. That he had put away, um, but she says she did, he didn't want to wear them anymore, and she says I haven't seen you without them in a long time. And I'm, I'm guessing that's his original form, uh, his skin suit, so to speak, or his image. And he, she says uh, something happened, and she goes that sometimes it's hard for it's hard. Uh, sometimes I forget how hard it is for you. Uh, I should have been there for you more. I guess it's going to happen. And I guess what's being shown here is that uh, he realizes that he's going to have to respond back. Um, and from that, he then goes on to talk to Rosemary. And he says, I can see what others cannot see. I looked into the eyes of God, and it looked through everything. And what he says to Rosemary is, you're less than nothing. And he says, you're just spit in the wind. So I guess what he is saying here is that she's nothing more than from the same creation of, um, if that is Lilith, that is the case. Now, if it's Mary, it's another case. But, you know, it's again, it's one of those scenes that I have to really think about. Honestly, I think that she is agency of Sophia and a, a really bad one. And he is acknowledging what a failure she is what what a failed attempt she is and um this attempt that sophia had tried to create in the form of rosemary mary is a failure and dr niles um acknowledging that you know you're not going to win this time you're just spitting the wind and i'm going to set you free Yes, and number 71, he says, I'm going to set you free in a very demonic, distoned voice. So again, he's showing uh, what he's there to do. Um, now, we flash to this pyramid computer is now really, I guess it's created <coughs> completely. And I put here that Jehovah's computer has now set things into motion after uh, Dr. Nile, which... Uh, I failed to mention, stabs Rosemary's eyes with his thumbs and then moves on, basically. After he's had the confrontation, he sets her free. Um, and from that scene, we flash to see this pyramid-style thing, computer, now being activated. And we also see, again, the eye with the pyramid being cast upon the eye. So uh, I made the uh, allusion to say that uh, Jehovah, through his image, is now making things in the works happen. Um... Number 73, we see Elena, and basically her time has come. Now it's time for her to be unleashed into the world. And an interesting side note to this is that Elena, El is also, uh, like El is in God, which is Jehovah, is also another, um, uh, in terms of the um, wordage, I guess you could say, El is, is another abbreviation for God, which is Jehovah God. Um, and I guess from this scene we see here, again, the pink and the yellow, 
And I guess that the beginning of this age has now been set in motion, or the anti Antichrist cycle time has begun. And we then see Elena now leaving the doorway or the veil into the corposer or the outside world, and the cycle of this time frame for her to do her work has now begun. And from that, we see, again, a triangle, which is the uh, basically an inverted triangle, which is the representation. Yeah, yeah this scene is basically a blessing, an inverted triangle, saying that you are the Femme Sapien. You know, you are, you are the Queen Vagina that is going to rule this Earth. Yes. And so we see that inverted triangle there uh, show on screen. And number 76 is where we see the elevator again. And obviously, like I've mentioned previously, the elevator is a representation of the ascension or descension to different dimensions or realms. And Elena now goes up to the elevator, and so now she's descending through the elevator to the lower realms. And we see her in the elevator now, and you have each and every single button, which is different dimensions or different levels. And she clicks the one below it, so she's now descending. Um, and again, in Kabbalah, they represent this as the tree of the Sephiroth descending to the lower realms. Now, once Elena is in the elevator, the elevator door opens. And we see her meet the first legion. Or you could equate this to being one of the gatekeepers of this, uh, I guess, dimensional doorway. Not possibly an archon. Um, or part of the Demiurge. And from that, she passes. I guess what happens is she closes the elevator doors and now continues to descend. So I guess what I find interesting about this now that I have thought about it is that in the beginning it said run program sentinels. And now all of these things are walking on each of the different levels. So those things were activated to basically, which I believe possibly not only could they be legion, but they're probably the demiurge controlling the different gateways possibly. I'm not sure. Kind of like Cerberus, uh, the uh, dog that guards the underworld. Yes, and just like in Harry Potter, you have the three three headed dog. Right. Um, that's another Gnostic movie. Got to review is the uh, Harry Potter series. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. <laughs> yeah, that's that's actually quite telling. Believe it or not, there's a lot of stuff in there. Um, now Elena goes and finds herself in what seems to be an air vent which is a representation of, obviously, a different dimension or a different level. She pulls out a black cube, which represents a dimension, um, or a prison that she's now trying to access. And um, basically, it houses the different levels of reality, which is the cube of the prison that Philip K. Dick talked about, which is the black iron cage, which is the cube. And through that, Elena then goes through the air vent, and she's now finding herself in this tunnel, a very deep and vast tunnel, with these different air vents or holes that go all the way down and uh, she finds herself uh, trying to cross over to one of them. What I find interesting is that, um, well, I guess that would make sense. I was thinking, how did she get over there? But she actually went back and through the other side. She crossed the rainbow bridge, which was represented as the pipes laying down on the ground. Right. Now, in number 81, we see Elena now uh, pushes the, another symbolic representation of the cube through the, one of these air vents, which is a cell. H cube is basically a cell. And she pushes that cube. And, uh, you know, Johnny had made a point to me that it's like a honeycomb, of course, because each, uh, every single cube is like a cell that makes up the whole. Um, and when she does that, she wakes, she, she pushes the cube and finds herself in this white room. And there is a demonic entity laying there in a straitjacket. And what Johnny and I had, uh, thought about potentially is what if these demons or legions were all of the failed creations of Jehovah basically and that they there was something wrong with them that they just didn't get right so they became demons. That's that's what I think is that Elena is exemplary of a creation that did make it and as you know being allowed out into the prime material world. And obviously Elena now leaves the, she barely makes it out as this demon's making all these really disturbing noises and trying to get after her. She escapes through, and right before the demon freaking goes after her, she seals the door, which is obviously the representation of sealing that veil 
or that glass prison cube hive cell that that demon is in, and she seals it. Um, now, as that happens, Elena goes back to the elevator, and she descends even further and hits the button below that. And now she's going into the absolute lowest level, which is the corpozo, which is where we're at. Right. And she hits the last button on the dimensional elevator. And when she does that, the door or the veil, again, the elevator or doorways are separated. The veil of the curtain is being pulled back to access that dimension. She now finds herself face-to-face -face with one of these red uh, legion or gatekeeper archon demiurge entities um, standing in front of the doorway. And uh, she stares at this thing, and this thing pulls its uh, helmet off or whatever, and it's probably blind, and it's uh, just a demonic-looking entity. Uh, and she was able to move past it, and I guess that thing knew that she had a job to do, or otherwise the thing was blind, and, and it was a gate. I guess it was symbolic of the gatekeeper entity had let her pass, uh, I guess. Now, as that happens, Elena now finds herself into what seems to be a break room, which is, <laughs> John, I'll let you take this one because this is what uh, we find quite interesting. But well, she I finds mean, herself in a break room. Yeah, the break room is really banal. It's it's sort of an interstitial realm between the Heil and the Corposa. This is like a little tiny uh, passageway, a checkpoint that Elena can go through and go from one dimension into the other. And so once she opens that blue door, okay, she is now released into this reality in which we enjoy. And it's it's funny because it has, uh, you know, like really bad, like, uh, <laughs> you know, bad <laughs> elevator music, like, right. and everything like that. And you have your, your, your toaster oven, your little microwave, your coffee pot, your tiny fridge, but all she has to do is walk out the door and she does that into thought, the false magic kingdom. I soon believe that potentially what this scene was representing here is that this room, this break room is kind of like an interme intermediary point between dimensions of some sort. So right. Sure. Interstitial. Yeah. Yeah. You know. So she opens the door and now she's in the false magic kingdom, which is again where we are at. Uh, I guess also Another thing is that the false magic kingdom is not just the dimension we're at, but it's the whole—it's the whole thing. It's the whole universe, basically. The whole thing that comprises it is the false magic kingdom. Yeah, she's being born into this world, and that is now shown of this garden that she opens that door from, and um, she uh, goes into this garden, which I guess you could use that as the equation to the Garden of Eden. And as she goes to this garden, you see this uh, Epcot style of uh, architecture in the garden, which is the representation of uh, a, a false magic kingdom. Um, and so what you see, though, here is that you see these little triangles going up and down, which are like honeycombs. But what you have to see is through that, it's actually cubes. And each cube is a dimensional reality, I guess you could say, housing uh, different aspects of this whole thing that comprises the whole Epcot ar architecture. And they're held together by double X's, which is the si seal of Saturn. Which is held together by five points, which hold all levels of the dimensional cubes at the same point. That's right. So she now breaks through to this vent, and now she has entered in the Corposa. And it has begun. And so, uh, as you see at this scene, she's now left that uh, place where she was at, and now you're able to see the Epcot style architecture with the cubes. And some people might not be able to see it, but you can see cubes in there, and, and you see the X that holds together the five points throughout the reality. Each cube comprises a reality or a cell, and it all make up the whole entire false magic kingdom. Right. She she has found an exploit in that architecture and crawled out of it, and has now been born into this earth. She's left the Garden of Eden now and has decided to walk upon the world of shame you know and and, and distrust and and reality and and that is where her new realm will be that she will take over as the antichrist 
But meanwhile, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> meanwhile, uh, number eighty-nine, we see Doctor Nile, and he's now back in his uh, the Arborea Institute looking for Elena. And what's really creepy about this specific picture is that his eyes are black, representing a demonic entity, basically. And um, I guess what he has realized is possibly he goes after her, um, trying to find out uh, where she's at. Now, I had made a note to this to say, well, in terms of the Gnostic analysis of this, could it be that he'd realized what he had done wrong and he wants to put an end to it before it gets out of hand so that maybe he could be the one that inherits the kingdom instead of her, so he wants to kill her so that he can you know, be the one in charge. Or it could be that he realized what he had done and he wants to control it and possibly put an end to it. Yeah, it's possible, yeah. Now, Johnny, I remember that we t discussed um, that he put a syringe in his foot. Now, did that kill? Did that kill him? Or you know? I, I, I think uh, Arborea is dead. You know, the concept of Jehovah is dead now. It's you know, it's 1966. God is dead. You know, we oh, okay. have to make room for a new one. So here we go. Possibly Dr. Nile was going to take a hold of being the new Jehovah. I think that's what he was hoping for. But unfortunately, a new one was chosen in 1966 when the the dying Lilith gave birth to Elena. I see. So Dr. Nile now is in Elena's uh, little prison room cell. And what he finds is that she's no longer there. And obviously her bed is a black cube representing her being in that prison. It's just another... Uh, example of that. Now, Dr. Knott leaves the Arbor Institute. Now he's in his car and he's going after Elena. And uh, he's driving in his car. And what happens is while he's in his car, he has this kind of split personality, which makes me wonder now that we had mentioned the possibility that through that syringe, you might have killed Dr. Uh, Arborea. And he says in his car, you're doing well, Dr. Arborea. And he goes, thank you. So could it be that Dr. Arborea has taken hold of a split personality where Jehovah is the representation of Dr. Nile in the suit, in the white, as we see in the white background, the Heil, and then we see the other side of him, which is in the car, and he's thanking Jehovah or Dr. Arborea for what he's done and that he's doing a good job. You know, that's uh, another Yeah, thing. well, of course, because they're both uh, aspects of a fractured psych a psyche. Yeah, so I, I think that possibly Jehovah is now riding along with Dr. Nile or some, some something along those lines. Now, number 92, Elena looks up into the stars as she sees in the Corposa, which is where she's located. And she's looking up because she descended, remember, through the dimensional elevator. So she's looking up to where she came from, which is, the again, the as above, so below. And she's looking up into the stars, and we see a galaxy of some sorts uh, being shown there, which looks like a snake um, with an eye, possibly. Now, number 93, we see Elena now laying in the grass. And Johnny had made the point to say now she has inhabited the Corposa. She realized this is where she will be ruling. Yeah, she has claimed her realm, and this is where her rule begins as the Femi Sapien. And after that, we see a very interesting scene, um, very off-putting, very interesting scene, which is this group of two guys that are just drinking beers and, you know, just, you know, getting drunk and through this fireplace, which kind of is like an allegory to Plato's cave, if you will. It's humanity in a sense. And they're listening to this, like, metal music, and what happens is the, the tape runs out which could be a representation of the cycle running out for humanity. I think now. so, yeah, exactly. Because now Elena is on the loose, and obviously through the Antichrist, it's the end of the cycle, and thus a new one begins with her and all that stuff. And um, number 95, one of the guys uh, is, well, we see Dr. Dial come up with one of the guys with a knife, and he's holding up to his throat, and he goes, uh, you know, I, I smell, I can smell you on her. And basically what this is alluding to, going back to a movie we watched with, um, uh, I'm not going to mention his name. <laughs> we watched a movie uh, of this very scene being illustrated through that guy's work of, of the humanity having intercourse with Jehovah's creation. 
you know, and so you know, this is kind of a and Jehovah and, and Jehovah was jealous of that. Yes, absolutely. And it could be that Dr. Nile has now taken the persona of Jehovah, you know, possibly through the split personality. I, I think you're right. I think that that emit that scene in the car was sort of a passing of the torch from Jehovah to Dr. Nile and now, you know, he feels that he is there to be the Lord of Elena. I, I believe so. Because uh, that scene, now that I thought about it, that specific scene itself was obviously he mentioned Dr. Arboria, but he also mentioned Dr. But Dr. Nile was driving. So I guess something, there was a transition of him passing on the reins, so to speak. Now, as we, on the final end of this review here, we see. Dr. Now finds Elena, and he was tracking her through this device, like a GPS tracker, and he finds her. And then basically what happens is he, he wants her to come here, and he goes, please come here, my sweet Elena. And um, she backs away from him, and then Dr. Nile trips on a rock and dies. And that's the end of Dr. Nile. So, uh, you know, that's just the end of that end of that scene that's how he dies he trips on a rock and, and falls over and then finally to put an end to this review we have the final scene which is represented here as elena now is in the corposa and she finds herself in this field and she looks over to this fence representing the veil the final veil i guess you could say uh and you see this quaint suburban neighborhood with somebody watching tv in the uh in one of the rooms there, and I guess the way that you could uh, allude this is that it's a sleepy suburban town that does not know what awaits. Ah, but there's a lot more imagery in this shot that you you want to take a look at. Where does she go toward the image of the flickering television screen? And what exactly is a television screen? That television screen is the medium by which Elena will broadcast her message of the Femme Sapien. She's being drawn toward her future. Oh, wow. That television is the retina of the mind's eye. And that retina of the mind's eye is a collective representation of the consciousness of humanity. And through that representation, she will use that as the vehicle by which she will grain, uh, attain rulership throughout the world. It I would have never so, that. No, man, that is so simple. You did. <laughs> yeah, man, she's going right toward that. She's she's like, wow, you know, that is, that's my boat. That's my airplane. That's my truck. I'm going right toward that. You have to remember, like I said in our last episode about this, Elena is... The Femi Sapien. She's the Antichrist. She is here to 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 achieve power. Um, she is not this wounded little bird that is trying to find her own voice and escape uh, captivity. She was allowed to leave. Why was she allowed to leave? Because it was her job to go and rule this world. And that, that television screen right there is representative of her ultimate goal. You know, whether it be through a computer or through a, a, a smartphone or whatever kind of uh, technology that comes about to, to, you know, connect people on a mass level. That, that is a mass media vehicle of engagement, and she's going right toward it. Yes, I think. <coughs> pardon me. I, I, I now that I see that, I, I, uh, I recognize that now, and, and it makes perfect sense. You know, it's she's she's there to broadcast, and obviously yeah. the Antichrist. Uh, she is. Uh, that's the main tenet is that it will be broadcast throughout the whole world. Well, yeah, man. I mean, if you're the Antichrist and stuff, what what's the first thing you're gonna do? You know, you gotta get a Twitter account. You know, you gotta start <laughs> tweeting shit. You gotta go and get a YouTube channel. You gotta go and disseminate your information, and um, they're not too proud to do that. You know, they're they're more than proud to do that. Well, that sums up the Beyond the Black Rainbow review uh, part two series. We had to do a, a one and two. This was quite an in depth 
uh, Gnostic analysis that we had done here. And I hope, you know, this uh, movie, if you guys go and watch it, definitely need to watch it if you're into Gnosticism or want to learn about it. It definitely is a movie to watch. And um, very telling, a lot, very in-depth movie. You have to watch it. You know, our breakdowns do not even come close to watching this in person. Uh, it's very, very, um, you know, need, need to watch for sure uh, if you're a Gnostic or you're trying to learn. Um, so with that being said, Johnny, is there any other any other thing you'd like to mention? Well, I want to let you know that we're having part one and two. We're going to um, we're going to have that with all the visuals um, uploaded in the next day or two. And we're also going to have our MGTOW hangout that we had on Elements uh, personal channel uh, re-uploaded here uh, for you to watch. And um, there's a lot of great information on all three of those transmissions. And uh, with that being said, I want you all to have a great midnight. All right. With that being said, we'll see you next time. And thank you for tuning in. And uh, have a good one.